Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time it's a Philips PM9355 current probe and uh, amplifier. So this is the current probe itself. So the probe is an is, is a passive AC only probe. And then there is an amplifier, and unfortunately the amplifier is a little bit defective. Uh, I think it's just a few capacitor that's uh, leaked. And then there's a little bit of mechanical. It was uh, packed really, really poorly, so it was damaged during, during uh, transport. Some plastic part here broke and all that stuff. Because uh, the shipper just put it in a box with some styrofoam here in the end and nothing at the side here. So the entire case just completely broke and of course created damage. So this is what you need to do when you're packing stuff. Always make it soft. Think about you should be able to drop it from a meter to the floor. On top of that, the power supply, the original power supply is also broken. Um, some shorted um, caps and uh, the voltage selector switch is not working either. The thing is, this power supply, there is no connector. So here on the, on the back, uh, that will be the BNC output to your oscilloscope. And then the power supply, see there's no connector, it's just a wire out of the back so you can't just directly uh, reconnect another power supply you need to cut the cable and fix all that so that will maybe be my second option but first i think it could be fun just to see if it's possible to repair the power supply it's plus minus 15 and uh, so that means we got three wires in that cable right a ground and a plus minus and inside the power supply, we got two voltage regulators. Like that. So um, I believe it's running on plus minus 12 volts and also on plus minus 9 volts. That's just a Cena uh, diode. But first, I really want to play a little bit with the passive current probe. Let's test how this works or if it works before we proceed because if this is completely broken then there isn't really a lot of need for me to spend a lot of time trying to repair uh, the amplifier, right? So the probe itself uh, should be able to go all the way from 12 hertz to 70 megahertz. It is uh, quite complex this thing. It consists of some coils, uh, several sets of coils, some resistors and frequency compensation circuits, and also some adjustment screws here for frequency and uh, gain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, the cool thing about this probe is also it works both ways. So you can also use it for inject current into some circuits. So here's how I want to test the probe itself. It says a little info here on the probe. 0.5 volts per amp into 50 ohms. I don't know how easy that is to see for you guys here on the screen. But on a modern scope, you can just take a channel and say 0.5 volts per amp. And then it's going to read out directly in amps as the probe dictates. I think I will limit the bandwidth to 200 megahertz because I don't want to have a lot of extra noise. And here is my load impedance on that channel, 50 ohms. Okay, so far so good. And then the other channel. See, here's my signal generator. And my signal generator is also supposed to be loaded with 50 ohms. 
so I know exactly what I got. So to measure the voltage here on across a 10 ohm resistor, and then I have about 40 ohms here, okay, 39, right? Plus 10, so that's very close to 50 ohms. So that means my signal generator likes that load impedance. And here I measure the voltage over that means I can measure the current, okay? So by connecting my current probe like this, okay? I now measure the current in that loop and I measure the voltage over the 10 ohm on channel one. So now I should be able to see what's going on, right? So as you see here, I got 100 millivolts per division on the yellow channel. And uh, that is of course 10 milliamps per division because it was a 10 ohm resistor, right? So here, this is already configured because this is how the scope translates um, the input for uh, a half a volt per amp. And then I just dialed the range of the red channel down to 10 milliamps per division. And as you see here, it's uh, quite the same. Yeah, it's a little bit higher, but this is a 10 kilohertz signal and it's uh, quite fine. We can just go up in frequency. So that was 10. Let's just crank it up to 100. And all is still fine. Obviously, this setup here with the resistors and the wires and all this hanging and dangling here, right? Obviously, you should not expect this to go all the way to 70 megahertz. So I totally don't expect that. But let's see how well it performs uh, anyway. So this is a 100 kilohertz. Let's just crank it up to 1 megahertz. And it's, of course, still pretty fine. And then I would expect... That is 10 megahertz. And yeah, you see, this is my input. This is my um, voltage over this resistor, right? And now it's getting lower, but my current is still higher. So <laughs> I actually think uh, there is a bandwidth problem with that resistor because the current is still correct. And that was 40. 50, 60, 70, and here's the, the 3 dB uh, point of the probe itself, and that is about half. So I think uh, that this is a reading error due to um, the resistors and all that kind of stuff. This is actually correct. So I believe the probe is actually performing to specifications, so that is fantastic, and that means... I should carry on uh, playing around with the amplifier. So now I'm ready to assemble off the power supply. I set off the old caps. One is definitely shorted and the other one seems to be more or less okay. But of course you want to change both of them. So this is how I've done that. It should be able to be within the size because they got it more or less the same size, right? Uh, there was another problem. The built-in uh, thermal fuse is open, so that tells me that the shorted capacitor here was, of course, not uh, figured out. <laughs> it, it's, uh, of course, overdriving the transformer, and this way opening the thermal fuse. So I added at least a little melt fuse here instead of the thermal. And since we have a broken volt meter, uh, volt range selector, and it flips between those two solder points. Uh, I'm just going to solder wires directly from here to here, and then try and make those really, really nice and short. So I can just assemble all this, and then I will be done with that. So now I'm ready to power this up. And everything is nice and fine, uh, I believe. <laughs> Let's look a little bit at the power supply section here, right? One thing that bothers me a little bit, or I find special, look at those two resistors. 
they are directly on the input supply to ground. And that is, of course, because there isn't any discharge resistors inside the power supply. And you want to have a nice discharge um, power sequence of this unit. So that's why you discharge that way. So we've got um, positive and negative 12 volt uh, regulators. We've got the two capacitors on the outputs. The fun thing is that we got serious resistors with the outputs to those capacitors. That's also a little bit funny, isn't it? And um, yeah, there was a capacitor removed here by the previous owner. Something about a leaked capacitor or something like that. And that is a little bit special. It's a 1.5 microfarad um, 63 volts. And it just shows how crazy <laughs> a component library I got. Because I just go into one of my drawers and pick up exactly that component. 1.563. So it's that easy. And then I can put that in right here. And we should be ready to rock and roll. I'm really happy to show you guys that I was able to find the problem. And it is now fixed. Well, I used a uh, another transistor just to prove my point. And I will, of course, need to get another transistor one day. But as you can see here, all the different gain settings work. And this is, remember, I still have exactly the same signal, the 10 milliamps per division. And this unit says here on the front, your scope must be in uh, 20 millivolts per division. And then this is 10 milliamps per division now. So this is how it works, right? And... As you can see here, my red curve is exactly the same as my my stimulating signal, right? So this is the correct signal and this is the measured signal and it's exactly the same. So, yeah, that's the division and all that kind of stuff. So, what did I do to solve this big mystery? Let's look a little bit on the schematic. I should of course uh, put this up here in the in the screen so you can see what I'm doing because looking here this picture is really bad. I was measuring around in this area here and everything was kind of wrong. And then I measured on the input of the first transistor signal was good and on the output it was looking clipped. But the way that this worked, that this transistor drives this one, and there's a feedback system, uh, actually two feedback systems in this uh, loop around here. So that made me figure out that maybe it's not this one. It could have been the others here, but I didn't have any AC signals anywhere here. So I changed this transistor, and it is a little bit of, of a special transistor. It's called BF173. It's a high-speed NPN transistor with uh, four pins. And if we look here, this is the pinout uh, seen from the bottom. So that is the shield of this uh, part. So I just took a random 2N2222 and uh, by bending the pins a little bit, I was able to figure out the pinout. You can see I had to swap two of the pins to make it work in the socket but then of course it works and all the different range relays and all that kind of stuff uh, still works so I'm <laughs> really happy that I didn't have to uh, bother too much about all these uh, read relays they are really really difficult to change and um, so I didn't want to do that what cool lock is that oh by the way this uh op amp as you see here um the tca uh 220 
It is a little bit weird. It's a 16-pin package uh, with three op amps in one package. And the special about this one is the output is not a push-pull. So, and you need uh, individual compensation components and all that kind of stuff. And the last of the three op amps, you have an individual power supply. So you can use this as a two op amps or three op amps. And then you don't even have to power up the last op amp. So that's uh, quite uh, cute. And I was so afraid if the problem would have been this op amp, oh, I didn't have any, any chance to replace it because I don't have any op amps uh, this special type. Let's try and have a little look on how this performs with the amplifier. And uh, this is 10 megahertz. And obviously it's perfect, right? So that is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 and 70. And this is uh, the specifications for minus 3 dB. Oh yeah, look at look at how crazy it is now, right? And this is definitely what you would expect because your impedance and uh, inductance and all that kind of stuff in your loop here is now definitely not super good. But at least you can see what I'm saying. It it really works, <laughs> even though I got a completely wrong transistor mounted so i only got one little detail to show you i want to show you the bottom side of the unit i think it's quite funny i, I mean remember this unit is from 1980 and of course it's been repaired a little bit you can see quite a lot of solderings and changed components here and there and whatnot right and look at the back side. It's also full of uh, little funny modifications. Here's a little wire and those capacitors. That is ground to chassis and chassis is also connected to the ground plane down here. But they think that adding those two capacitors to chassis improves something and that will be the two regulators capacitors <laughs> but i'm super happy now it's working all we need to do is figure out the little mechanical uh, issues so i think i will end the video here and say uh, thank you very much for watching see you again real soon